Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Nnameki Kegwono, and uh, over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about code hubs and what we did in Nigeria to uh, tackle food spoilage. You know, um, like Rob said, um, I'm actually a farmer. I still grow pineapples and cucumbers, which are very lovely and delicious. <laughs> um, I am a radio presenter and a social entrepreneur, and I founded Smallholders Foundation in 2003 as a rural development organization that uh, will empower farmers with education, uh, but we use only radio to deliver the messages and follow up with our field practical demonstrations. But in as much as I'm going to talk about code hubs, I want to begin by uh, making a further introduction to the work I do. Over the past 15 years, this is what I do. I spend 30% of my time at the studios of the Smallholder Farmers Rural Radio, a radio station I established in 2007, just giving out messages, receiving phone calls, and so on. But the other time, this is what I love doing. 70% of my time I spend in the field, engaging with farmers, trying to identify challenges and opportunities within the smallholder agricultural space. And it was in the course of my travels across more than 3,000 villages and communities in Nigeria, east, west, north, and south, that we discovered a problem. That an estimated 93 million Nigerian smallholder farmers are unable to save their food. They lose 45% of their food due to lack of cold storage. You know. And these farmers lose an estimated 25% of their income. Those statistics came from the Rockefeller Foundation Food Waste Initiative. But listen, in the course of going in the field, I've seen more losses and more income being lost as a result of this. For you to understand the magnitude of this problem, you need to understand that the entire supply chain does not exist. It is broken, actually. You know. In this picture, I have Ahmed, very young farmer in Kanu, in the north of Nigeria, tomato farmer. You know, every day, Ahmed harvests about three to five baskets of tomatoes, you know. But the moment Ahmed plucks that tomato from the tree, the clock begins to tick for that tomato. He's in a hurry. He must sell as quickly as possible. And Ahmed makes a quick phone call, and he calls Eugene. Now, Eugene arrives with his van, and Eugene starts to sleep. We think Eugene sleeps too much. <laughs> And you can see him sleeping down there, and there is a tomato lying next to him. But Eugene does not sleep in the afternoon because he really loves sleeping. He understands that it takes several, several hours for Ahmed and other farmers within that cluster to gather their tomatoes, put in the basket, and stack inside his truck. It's stacked wrongly, and the clock continues to tick for that tomato. Now, Eugene makes a 14 hours road trip on the most Difficult roads you can imagine. He arrives at the central market in the south of Nigeria. It, he hands over that tomato to Alex. Alex is both a wholesaler and a retailer. And Alex, first of all, has that umbrella to protect his head. It's very hot out there. 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very hot. And he leaves the tomato. Meanwhile, the tomato arrived battered. You know. Now, I'm a, Alex is struggling to sell that tomato as quickly as possible. But the clock continues to tick for that tomato. Six hours into that market day, Alex is running around. He gathers fresh leaves to save his tomatoes. But that is not refrigeration. It doesn't extend shelf life. The clock continues to tick for that tomato. And listen, in the morning, he can sell for $60 a basket. By this time, 12 noon to 1 PM, he can sell $30 that same basket of tomato. By 6 p.m. that day, that's what happens to most of the tomatoes and other perishable food. They dump it and they go. And why they do that is because what you can sell at this 6 p.m., say yeah, $15 or $10, you know, if you get anyone who is interested to buy it. You know. And this is what happens. You know. But we wrongly understood that cold refrigeration can actually extend shelf life. Everyone knows that. But they are not existent in Nigerian farms and marketplaces because most of the solutions are not rugged enough to withstand our weather conditions. Power grid is unreliable. 
And most of them, you know, when I travel to the U.S. and Europe, I see huge warehouses. You know, most of our uh, farmers don't have access to that. You know, but what we did was to look at the whole picture, and we set up code hubs as a social enterprise that actually designs, installs, and commissions 100% solar-powered working code rooms in farms and in marketplaces. Anywhere there is need to refrigerate food, we go and build a code hub. It generates its own energy, stores its own energy. And the goal there is to provide 24 hours refrigeration. Each code hub is very robust, very well designed. We first of all calculate the weather patterns in the site that we are installing to make sure that we oversize the systems to give room for rainy and cloudy days and build a huge energy storage for rainy and cloudy days. But the game changer in creating adoption is the educational model that we deliver. So we developed a 12 model uh, post-service management uh, educational comic in the local language that we use to teach these farmers, retailers, and wholesalers everything from best practices in harvesting to the financial benefits calculated over time of having a high quality fruit and vegetable for sale. You know. The goal for us is to extend the shelf life of this food from two days to 21 days, giving farmers, retailers, and wholesalers more opportunity to haggle on prices and sell when they are comfortable with the price. You know. And over the past two years, what we've done is to save 5,722 tons of food from spoilage. Uh, we've installed five cold hubs uh, all across Nigeria. We have six more coming up before the end of the year. We've signed up 320 farmers and retailers and the wholesalers as our customers, and they've increased their income from 60 US dollar every month to 120 US dollar every month. The impact is so visible. But again, we've been able to create 10 new jobs for women, and what we did with these women is by recruiting and training them as our hub operators and attendants. And that's what we do. The entire code hubs operation are driven by these ladies. The hub operator sees to the loading and offloading of food and collecting user fee, whereas the market attendant sees to a continuous education in the market to make sure that she onboards new customers every day. Our revenue model is very simple. So what we do is to charge the equivalent of 50 US cents, which is 100 Naira, to store one of those plastic crates, 20 kilograms, inside the cold room. You know. Each code room can hold 150 of those crates, and uh, we are actually making 75 US dollar every day since August 18th last year, that we are able to hit 100% utilization across all our five code hubs. And with that income, we are actually deploying uh, additional code rooms. So at 100% utilization from day one, if you can achieve that, which is difficult, but <laughs> because a lot of education has to be done, you can... Uh, actually uh, generate the capex uh, revenue of 27,000 which it costs to deploy one code room in one year and at 50 percent it will take you approximately two years to generate that uh, uh, capex that was our financials uh, uh, 2017 we met 32,000 uh, US in revenue and net income of 7,000 we are very confident that this year we will make 173,000 in revenue and uh, 123,000 in uh, income. We noticed that our operational cost in 2019 is low and because uh, in 2019 we will not be deploying more code rooms. We have reduced cost in maintenance and uh, reduced cost in transportation and reduced cost in uh, educational uh, curriculum delivery. The team behind Code Hubs are unique. Um, I'm supported, uh, as CEO, I'm supported by Bright, who is our Chief of Operations, as an MBA, very well experienced in agribusiness. Uh, Chidubim Maxwell, who builds the Code Hubs uh, in five days, he can deploy one code room. And Emeka, who is acting as our business development and also does all our social media and ICT. Um, we've been supported greatly. Um, by a lot of partners, and sorry about uh, pictures, it changed. Uh, GIZ, the World Food Program, um, Swiss Ref, Factor E, all on uh, Global Coaching Alliance, and so on. So actually, we are still on the road raising funding. We are raising uh, 1.3 million US dollar to deploy uh, 40 more code hubs uh, across uh, high potential food production and consumption centers in Nigeria, and. Uh, 
if we if we are able to do that, 2019 will be great. It will mean that we have 52 code rooms, uh, 7,800 crate inventories, and even at 50% uh, utilization rate, we, we think we can end revenue of about 702,000 US dollar and net income of uh, 391,000 US dollar. And that's where we want to deploy our 40 code hubs. You know, uh, up in the north uh, is the is the biggest food production belt in the whole of West Africa. Kaduna, Kano, Kastina, Jigawa, Sokoto, Gombe, Axis. Those guys produce more than 50 million tons of fresh fruit and vegetable every year. And they lose more than 50% of it to spoilage. And we want to deploy in the south of Nigeria too, which is uh, uh, a little bit westernized. Uh, most of them western educated who are actually demanding for fresh food and safe food at the same time. And that's timeline for us, which is not really that important, just to talk about how we plan to deploy over the coming years. Uh, the market size, in as much as we are focusing in Nigeria, we are also looking at a uh, wider picture, going to countries where you have the blue circles, where food spoilage is huge, and uh, uh, deploying all across uh, South, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and uh, also uh, Latin America. So that's really a quick uh, overview of Code Hubs and what we do. And uh, I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you.